Hi everybody, this is Paul Friedman, founder of the Marriage Foundation, and this topic is an incredible topic. It really is. And I know you're going through very stressful times right now because you're wondering, is my marriage over? And this is a big deal. This is not a small deal because, let's face it, when you get married, it's for the rest of your life. That's the intention. And then you start seeing that things aren't going as well as they should be going. And now you go on the internet and what you're going to find are these signs. And I'm telling you they're false signs and I'm going to go through them so that you don't get scared to death so that you understand that it's not over for your marriage. It doesn't matter what's going on. Let me give you a great example, okay, a metaphor. Let's say you have a plant and you've been overwatering the dickens out of it and the leaves are wilting and they're turning yellow and you can almost hear it scream and you're crying, oh my God, I'm losing my plant, I'm losing my plant. And then someone comes over and they says, wow, you're really overwatering this plant. You stop overwatering the plant. What happens? It comes back to life. It's living. Your marriage is living. It is two of you souls who have gotten together on the foundation of love in order to have a harmonious, loving, happy existence. You're doing something wrong. And so there are going to be signs. But these signs that these pseudo experts have come up with aren't real. Let's go through the list. Let's not wait anymore. Number one, you're fantasizing about leaving. That's number one. Wow. Um, all right, let me explain this in the most simple terms that you'll understand because of your studies in high school when you learned about biological organisms and cells and what was the number one requirement that defines life. It's the drive to survive, isn't it? So your body is comprised of trillions of these cells. They all get together and so they all have the drive to survive. What is the drive to survive in action? You know this, fight or flight, right? Any sign of danger, fight or flight. What is fantasizing about leaving? Flight. So you're, you're picking up, I should say your mind is picking up, information that's telling you there's danger. You want to run away. That's all that that is. I have those feelings when I'm standing at motor vehicle department at the DMV. I want to get out of there. I fantasize about leaving. I still have to stand in line. I have to go through it. It's not a sign that your marriage is over. Number one is a false sign. Fantasizing about leaving is normal for almost everybody. It, but then when you get through that hard time that scared you, everything is back to normal because that drive to survive comes in and recedes. Okay, so don't worry. Number two, there's more bad than good in your marriage. Really? So what is marriage all about anyway? Marriage is all about achieving two primary things. This is really important stuff. You know, at the Marriage Foundation, and I wrote books before I started the Marriage Foundation. Over 20 years ago, I was a divorce mediator before I shifted my practice. And I wrote a book and then I started going back to the second Saturday divorce uh, workshop for women. And I would give talks and I would offer them my book. At that time, it was Lessons for a Happy Marriage. It's a good book. The second book that I came out with was Breaking the Cycle. 
And because I was a divorce mediator, I had a lot of insight into what happens to marriages. So I was able to address these things, but in a holistic manner. And a lot of people's marriages were saved at that time just by a combination of reading the book and meeting with me a few times. Now, people can't meet with me anymore, but now we have courses for men, courses for women, and it takes you through the steps that you need so that you can salvage your marriage because it's basically your marriage is going in the wrong direction. We know that, or you wouldn't be searching. It's going in the wrong direction. You got to turn it around and you can do it. So when you say more bad than good, sure, maybe, who knows? The problem is that the bad is overwhelming you and you have to learn and it's teachable and you have to learn how to sort, how to recognize what is a real problem in a marriage. There's not that many actually that are really, really bad problems and it's not the accumulation of little problems. It's not knowing how to deal with them at all. You know, if you try to pound in a screw, it doesn't hold well. But if you use a screwdriver, because you know what you're doing, it's a completely different result. So more bad than good is not a sign that your marriage is over, not by any means. Number three. Now this one, number three, says it all about how badly traditional marriage counseling vis-a-vis -vis Western psychological thinking has screwed up marriages because they're sort of like the ones who are the reported experts and they're not. So number three is you don't share your thoughts and feelings. Well, this is not true. Men rarely share their feelings because a man's design biologically makes him of the two of you, usually not a hundred percent of the time, but usually he's the warrior. Warriors don't share their feelings unless they're anger and they should never be sharing guys. You should never be sharing anger with your wife. Never, 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 ever because you're the protector. So that's when a man shares his feelings, when he's angry, when he's frustrated. Otherwise, he doesn't do that. And Western psychological thinking has convinced women that their husbands don't love them if they're not sharing their thoughts and feelings. In a typical good marriage, a woman expresses herself to her husband and the husband listens because he loves her and he cares and she's expressing but she's considerate of him to not overwhelm him with all of her stuff right it is certainly not the time that your marriage is ended because you're not sharing your thoughts and feelings with one another it's fine and besides different strokes for different folks some people like to share other people like to listen some people just like to look into each other's eyes. All right, number four, one of you gets defensive. Now, I'm doing my best not to editorialize when I read these, but let's go back to what I shared with you before about the drive to survive. What is defensiveness? Defensiveness is the drive to survive in action. But instead of having the thought of running away, you're having the thought of standing up to, and that means usually it manifests by getting defensive. Well, we should be very careful. Ladies and gentlemen, you should be very, husbands and wives, you should be very careful when you know that your wife or your husband is gonna be triggered by something, don't do it. Why would you do that? 
you, you don't step on somebody's toes when you know they just bumped into something. If that's a weakness on your partner's part, then you avoid it. You know, one of the cardinal rules that we have at the Marriage Foundation, and you really should visit our website, is you never confront, and this goes against Western psychological thinking completely, but never confront your spouse. If there's something going on, there is something going on. And if there's something going on, you need to ask why. And usually it can be traced back to a dysfunction on your part, usually. Now, if they are, for instance, cheating on you, you still don't confront them. But you recognize that if they're cheating on you, you're chasing them away. Now, I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm saying that this is their perspective. They don't know how to deal with it. They don't know what else to do, so they cheat. If you hold someone accountable for every single thing they do, and I'm not saying cheating is light, it's a big deal, but you have to understand that the first step is not to confront them and get them to change, because they won't. The first step, and this is why our course is so powerful, the first step is to go, am I behaving as the perfect husband, as the perfect wife? What can I do to give them more comfort with me? I want them to love me, to appreciate me, to be with me, enjoy my company. How can I change myself? Is it the end of your marriage? No, no. The end of your marriage, I'm gonna to get to that at the end of this video. All right, so if you get defensive, if they get defensive, it isn't the end of anything. It's merely how the mind functions because of the influence of the body upon the mind. We call it psychophysiological response. Now, what it number five is that you feel alone. You shouldn't feel alone when you're married. It's not the end of your marriage, but you should do something about that. Now, here's very important knowledge that I'm going to impart to you. A sense of feeling alone is not the same as appreciating solitude. Solitude is something that all of us need from time to time. It gives us the opportunity to look at ourselves, look at our behavior, and truly solitude gives us a time to become more in touch with our true self. We're souls and our true self is all love, is all wisdom. And if you are in a state of solitude, well, for instance, in meditation, then you feel tremendous peace, and then soon the joy starts to percolate. That's good. But feeling alone is feeling rejected, feeling by yourself, and you're in a marriage. You shouldn't be feeling by yourself. You should feel like your partner is with you. So is this a sign of the end of the marriage? It is not, but it is a sign that you're not connected well, that you're not in touch with each other, that you're not feeling one another's space as one space, which is what you really want in your marriage. The joy in a well-run marriage. And again, you get to a well-run marriage by learning how. The joy in a well-run marriage is indescribable because a well-run marriage brings you up here. You see, we live on three planes, you might say, at the same time. There's the primal plane where it's survival. And most people don't live there. The people who do end up in prison, hopefully, 
because they're all about taking, grabbing, destroying. It's just like an animal kind of existence. They want to eat. They want to eat yours too. So that's the primal. We all have that in us because it's shades of. The next is the mundane level. The mundane level is frankly where most people live out their lives. And I'll be honest, it kind of sucks. You are born, you go through your childhood, you go to school, you learn how to work, you go to work, you get married, you have children, you retire and you die. Nothing really happens. And as human beings, we're intended to evolve. We're intended to move more and more into connection to our heart. Marriage is the perfect vehicle to learn how to love unconditionally. You have the perfect person there. The problem is that the mundane, which is all material, because this other, this highest plane is the plane of love. It's the soul plane. That's where your marriage should be mostly taking place. But we get used to the mundane. We have to make money. We have to take care of the kids. We have to take care of the yard. And this mundane sucks us down. And so we don't live in the love. And when we're feeling lonely, it's because of that. We're living in the mundane. We're not putting the effort into the love. And it's something that we need to learn how to do. And it's not the fault of our parents and it's not the fault of our educators that we don't learn this because they don't know either. The Marriage Foundation is on the cutting edge. We are just starting to get the word out to teach people about marriage. And it's going to take time. Now we're making progress. Just on the YouTubes, we now have over 10,000 subscribers because people are slow and you could read the comments. People are really starting to get, wow, this makes total sense because marriage is a spiritual dynamic. Love is a spiritual reality and it's what we crave as human beings. So if you're feeling alone, it means you're putting your energy into the mundane existence that you have instead of the love marriage existence that you have. But you have to learn how to do this. All right, now, number six. You have a difference in sex drive. Now, some of the writers out there say you have a difference in intimacy. What they don't realize is that they're not at all the same. And this is one of the failures of the Western psychological approach to marriage. In that they don't recognize that intimacy is up here where I was describing before. Intimacy is about love. It's about identifying with yourself as a soul and your spouse identifies as a soul and you merge and you merge in a pool of bliss quite frankly your marriage is supposed to produce supposed to produce ever increasing happiness and ever expanding love because love has no boundaries so there is no difference in desire for intimacy. It's innate within us. Sex drive, pull the sex drive down. Remember you have your primal, then you have your mundane. It's somewhere in the middle. But you can use the sex that you have between you as a way of connecting your souls. But you can't just jump into that. And if you're driven by sex, the other person will oftentimes be driven away because sex is not fulfilling. Sex at that level is just to get rid of some energy, to dump energy, or to have some pleasure. It's entertainment. But in marriage, those things should be kept down here. You should be bringing it 
up here. Again, we're not taught these things. So you've had that experience when you're making love of the love. You've also had the experience of the pleasure, the erotic pleasure. The erotic pleasure doesn't come close. When you compare them side by side, the erotic pleasure is nothing and it's fleeting. When you're done, you're done. All you can do is talk about it. But when you connect at the heart level, it raises your marriage up. You can't put the cart before the horse on this one though. You have to create the dynamic of love between you. You have to raise your consciousness and connect first. And then you can use sex. And then you don't have a problem anymore. So is it a sign that your marriage is over? No, it is not. It is a sign that your marriage is not working the way it's supposed to work, which is what most of this is about. And most of the so-called experts say, okay, so then it's over. It's not working. You can't fix it. Nonsense. You can fix all of this, all of this. Then number seven is there has been infidelity. And we talked about that a little bit before. For some people, it is a deal breaker. Now, when the woman, she, and I don't mean to just throw this double standard at you because it's not a double standard. I'm going to explain it. And, and I'm going to explain it mechanically, biologically. Okay, so you really understand this. When a woman cheats, usually it's because she's already left her husband. Women are more heart-centric and they only, usually, not always, but usually only will have sexual relations with a man that she has deep feelings for, if not love. So when she does, it's usually over. That is a real sign that the marriage is over. When a man cheats, I have so many negative things I could say about men, even though I'm a man too, but in the context of the reality, because man is biologically much more simple and because he is driven by his biology, not excusing him. I am not excusing him. We should be able to control ourselves. But men often cheat because there's an opportunity. And biologically, again, the drive to survive, the subordinate drive to survive is the drive to procreate. Why? Because when we procreate, there's more of us and collectively we have a better chance of survival. So what happens is a man might cheat means nothing, can't even remember her name, went to a strip joint, whatever. When a woman cheats, she's gone. And for a man, I'm sorry to say this, appreciate the fact that too late, you're too late in wanting to heal your marriage. But women, you're not too late at all. And you have too much at stake to just let it go. Now's the time to really take a real look at yourself to go, have I been the kind of wife where my husband wants to be with me? Or do I snarl at him, complain, criticize? Do I do the things that push him away? Do I hold back sex? And now we could go back to that whole thing about sex and intimacy, but you didn't know. So the thing is, if your husband has been unfaithful, and I don't care whether it's pornography, because that's a form of unfaithfulness. I don't care if it's staring at other women, another form. I don't care if it's too much communication with women on Facebook. I don't care if he's having a, an emotional affair. I don't care if he's hanging out with his ex-wife. I don't care if he's actually had an affair. They're all the same. It's the same bucket. You can save your marriage. It's not your fault that he did that. It isn't. But you have the power 
to bring it all back. And for this, you completely 100% need, and it will work, the course for women. And we've helped thousands of women bring back their marriage, even in this extreme case. Do some fail? Not many, not many. And usually there's some extreme situation, like he's already left, he's already moved in, his girlfriend is pregnant. Then forget about it because he's left. So this one is different. There's been infidelity. For men, if your wife has cheated on you, it's over. And I'm just being candid. You may not like this, but it's true. And I know that it's true because for 20 years we've been seeing this. And I've talked to many therapists. They're still good people, by the way. I put down the Western psychological approach to marriage because it doesn't work, but I don't put down the people. The people are good people. They're sincere. They want your marriage to succeed. They just don't have the tools. But they're starting to learn from us. So if your wife is gone, she's gone. If your husband is on his way out, you can pull them back. So, sure sign, depends. All right, number eight, lack of respect, listening, and caring. Now, this is an interesting one because I call this overfamiliarity, and I list it as one of the three killers of marriage. Killers. Doesn't mean it's over. Every single marriage that ends, this is there. Over familiarity. Inconsideration, disrespect, you don't talk, you take each other for granted. The whole list goes on. Now if that's all that is happening in your marriage, just get one of my books. Either get Lessons for a Happy Marriage which was the first book that I wrote, and it doesn't go into as much detail as Breaking the Cycle, which goes into more detail, and it will help you. You don't need the course if this is all that is happening to you. All right, and men, you definitely should read these books too. And for men, frankly, I often suggest get the course for men, because men, we are more thick skin. We're boneheads. We, we hear things and we go, I get it, but you don't get it. And the Course for Men is a really strong process that bangs you over the head with these realities and shakes you up a little bit. I've been known to shake up people. In fact, when I met with men, usually I'd meet them in a public place because <laughs> I don't mind ticking them off and I don't feel like having them belt me they come around because they're in a public place and they calm down. So, okay, number eight is lack of respect. It is a sign that your marriage is heading towards divorce. Not a sure sign that your marriage is over, not at all. Okay, number nine, drug addiction, alcoholism, and we're not talking about drug addiction that you've had surgery and you've had to use these meds and you got addicted to them. We're not talking about that, although it turns into that sometimes. So here's the problem with alcohol. And you know these things. So alcohol is a depressant. We, those of us who use alcohol, I don't, by the way, I have not used alcohol since I was 21 years old. I have not had a drop. You know, put the glass to my lips so I don't embarrass people at weddings and stuff. Alcohol destroys brain cells. It erodes your willpower. This is a fact. It erodes your willpower. Your willpower is what you need to achieve anything and everything. One of the greatest 
tragedies of alcohol is that it is like stepping on a slide. You're just going to keep going down and you're going to be numb to it. Now, what causes people to want to escape so badly that they're willing to accept the side effects of alcohol, hangovers, headaches, disassociation at work from family. And I've thought about this a lot and I have shared my thoughts with many therapists and not one has disagreed with me. Does that make it true? Not necessarily, but see how it feels for you. I don't believe that people who are, who feel love, feel love, feel loved might be a better way to put it. Want anything to do with alcohol or drugs because they're happy. What brings you happiness guaranteed is that feeling of love. The very reason why you got married. So if your spouse is moving into that realm of alcoholism or drug abuse, pretty much the same, they're not feeling the love. You could turn it up. You could break those barriers. And you might say, well, how can I love them? You don't love unconditionally because of how a person behaves. You love your spouse because you determined as you were dating and courting that they were the person that you choose to love for the rest of your life. It was a choice. It was your free will, your choice. You don't get to take that back and experience the joy of marriage. You can't have conditions on your love. You can't say, well, now that you're an alcoholic or a drug addict, I don't love you anymore. Now there may be some practical ramifications. You may have to have a separate banking account. You might have to do certain things on a, in a pragmatic way, but you still have to do all you can to love and support them. That's what you signed up for. That oftentimes, will reduce their dependency on these substances and slowly give them the space to come back into themselves. You can literally become their savior. So if it is a sign for you that your marriage is over, I ask you to reconsider, reconsider your position, get out of judgment. And I don't say that in a condemning way, but it's what happens to us. Get out of judgment. And instead of seeing them down the end of your nose as someone who is failing and miserable and blah, 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 see them as someone who needs your help and see yourself as the one person who told them when you said better or worse that you would be there for them. You didn't cause them to go that route but you do have tremendous power to help them. And I ask you to consider that. So it can be a sign of the end of your marriage. It's up to you though. All right. Number 10, there are things you can't change. So this is the Western psychological idea coming across in a way that should boggle everyone's mind. You have free choice. You have willpower. You have free choice. Starting now, you can say or do or think anything that you choose because you have free will. I don't care what happened in your past. You have free will. I don't care how you're feeling about something. You still have free will. I don't care about what's compelling you to think, act, or speak in a certain way. You have free will and you have the ability to reason. 
to know that what you're used to doing won't be beneficial and you can change. <gasps> yeah, you can change. There is nothing you can't change. Now, if you break your arm, you can't change that. But we're not talking about that, are we? We're talking about your behavior. Your life exists now and the future begins now and you have all the power to control now and your destiny. You might be coming out of a hole. You may have done enough stupid things to put you into a hole, but you can climb out. You don't want to stay in a hole. So many people in the world stay in the hole. They fall into a hole, they try this, they try that, kind of random, they can't get out, they start hanging up the curtains and arranging the furniture. They live in the hole. You don't have to do that. You're a free-willed human being. Take it on. Face your challenges. Those challenges are a gift to you. Not only do they strengthen you, but they show you where your weaknesses are so you can change those. If you have a weak arm, you go to the gym, you start lifting weights, you strengthen your arm. Same is true with everything in life. It's not a sign that your marriage is over by any means. Number 11, constant fighting, criticism, blame. Yeah, stop. It's not a sign that your marriage is over. Stop. How insane is it? And most everyone does this. In fact, psychologists, when you go to a psychologist, they don't even tell you just stop arguing. You know what they do is they teach you better ways to argue. So stupid, it's unbelievably stupid. Before you open your mouth, think, am I arguing back? Am I fighting? Am I about to start an argument? Am I going to be critical? Am I going to be blaming? Yeah, free will. It's up to you. Again, we're not taught this. You know, I created this technique called the so technique. Because way back in the beginning when I started helping people, what I did was I devised a basically uh, 10 commandments. It was many more than that, but 10 commandments of happiness in marriage. Basically, it broke down into First of all, why did you get married? You got married in order to be happy, in order to feel unconditional love. Okay, got it. How do I get there? Well, the biggest thing, because it's natural for us to love, believe it or not, we're souls. The biggest thing are the don'ts. Don't look at each other that way. Don't criticize each other. Don't say mean things. Don't have expectations, a whole list. And I met with my first couple, and they happened to be my first couple who came to me to get a divorce. And they both broke down crying. They said, we don't really want to get a divorce. We just don't know what else to do. So I said, give me three months. And I worked out this whole process. And they came to me, and I'll call him John. John came back and he said, Paul, this stuff is great, but I can't stop myself. And I thought about it. I thought, wow, you know, this is, this is true. We have this mentality in our world that we can't break habits. So I worked on it and I came up with a tool. It's called the so technique. Now you can't just use the so technique or I'll just give it to you now, use the so. I'll tell you what it is. The so stands for S, stop. Wherever you are, you see you're about to do something stupid, just stop. And people go, whoa, that's hard. Yeah, but you can do it. Stop. Second, E, evaluate. And that could take on many different forms. You can evaluate, is this really the thing to say or do? That's one evaluation. Or is this going to enhance my relationship with my spouse? It's another evaluation. E is up to you. W is cool. W is wisdom. Stop, evaluate, then act with wisdom. Here's where it falls apart. 
<laughs> it doesn't fall apart when you understand the mind. So when you take the course, the course for men or the course for women, both of them pretty much begin with learning about the mind. And you might think, well, psychologists know about the mind, and no, they don't. I'll never forget the first time I gathered a group. There were like 20-plus therapists who I had vetted, and we brought them together, and I was teaching them my stuff, which is really good stuff. And I thought, okay, first thing I'll do is I'll go through the mind. They all know that already. We'll get it over with, then we'll move into the other stuff like communication, like uh, the sacred space of marriage, all, all of these other things. Well, I'm into describing the mind. In about 20 minutes, I look over and they're all like, like, what are you talking about? And I stopped <laughs> and, I, and I evaluated and I asked them, I said, is this, this isn't new to you, is it? Yeah. Western psychology is all about theory, but the mind is like a computer. When you understand it, but you got to understand it, then you could start mastering it. And if you can't master it, your mind is how you operate in the world. And if you can't master it, you can't change. And the so is useless. So it's important to take the course and, and get that understanding of the mind so you could start to master it. It's a lifelong pursuit. I haven't mastered my mind yet, but you, over time, and not a lot, you start seeing it change. So arguing, blaming, criticizing, fighting, these are stupid things in the context of marriage because you're married so you could experience love and then you do these things. It doesn't make sense. You should have the attitude, no matter what it takes, there's no way I'm going to argue anymore. There's no way I'm going to fight. There's no way I'm going to blame. There's no way I'm going to be critical, condemn. Okay. Is it the end of your marriage? No, but it's part of marriages that are not working. Okay. Number 12. Physical abuse. I'm not going to draw any lines here. You know what physical abuse is. There's no room for physical abuse. Now, maybe it happens when somebody gets drunk, so don't get drunk anymore. Maybe it happens when someone loses their temper. Don't lose your temper. There's no place for physical abuse in a marriage, period. And I've talked to some people. I had one guy call me up with his wife sitting there and he was explaining to me and I'm not going to tell you which culture because I don't even agree with him. He was saying, look, in our culture, hitting a wife is okay. And I said, man, if you really firmly believe that, don't even come to see me. Because he's living down here, primal. No one is superior to another because of their gender. No one has the right to inflict any kind of physical pain on another person. Uh, we're not talking about going to war. Much, much less in a marriage. It's just the opposite. So is that a sure sign? It's like a big stop or it's over kind of thing. So what is the one sign? that says your marriage is over. Well, I already shared a couple with you that are pretty strong. But other than that, someone filed. I've seen people unfile. Someone starting another family, that's a sure sign. It's extreme. Someone's a pedophile, get out of there. You find out someone is a gangster, get out of there. But otherwise, don't take these anecdotal things as common. They're not. There aren't that many pedophiles around. There's too many, but there's not enough around 
for that to be a consideration for when we help people with their marriages. There's not enough people who have married a gangster. You can save your marriage. Not enough though. I don't want you to just save your marriage. I want you to have, an amer have a marriage that provides you with why we get married in the first place. Unbelievable levels of happiness that, ex that it gets better every single day of your lives. Ever expanding love. Look, you're driving a car down the road, you get off the road, it feels like it's the end of the line. But when you get back on the road, everything is cool. I can get you back on the road. Get back on the road and have the marriage that marriage intends for you to have. Like this video, leave a comment if you want. I'm Paul Friedman. I founded the Marriage Foundation and I'm here for you. Thank you and God bless you. Take care.